Let's turn to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 and 14. A couple of verses, but I think these two verses are profound. Not only profound, but controversial. It, it, it may upset some of you. And I don't mean to do that on purpose. But remember, Jesus is speaking here. You, you'll notice in your scriptures that, that everything that is written there are all in red, meaning that they're the words of Jesus himself. And so uh, don't blame the messenger. <laughs> you know, I'm just the messenger giving the message of God's truth to his people. And so we're going to look at verse 13 through 14. Now, if I were to ask the question, are you going to heaven or hell, what would be your answer? You know, most people will say heaven. They'll usually say heaven, and then they'll pause, and they'll think about it, and they'll say, I hope. I hope, because they're really not sure. They don't really know in their hearts, or even understand intellectually in their minds, that they're has been a way approved by God to which you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. If you ask me that question, I would tell you, I'm going to heaven, without a shadow of doubt, because I know what the Bible teaches and I believe every word of it. And so we're going to talk about this narrow way to heaven that Jesus describes to us. Last week we ended in the study in verse 12, where Jesus says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And we spoke a little bit about how that is the golden rule, and that we need to think of others more highly than we think of ourselves, that we need to um, do to others as we will want someone to do to us. I watched the, the movie, uh, The War Room. How many watched The War Room? Go... <laughs> All your hands should be up. Go and watch this movie. It is amazing. And bring tissue because you will cry, you will laugh, you will rejoice, you'll scream out, amen. It is a great movie on prayer. It really is. It really encourages you. But they gave an analogy of this scripture so clearly where the daddy is driving down the road and he sees an enemy and the enemy has a flat tire and he's so frustrated and mad because they're not going to get there in time to fix the tire. And this guy sees him, he pulls over and he changes the tire for him. And the little kid in, in the vehicle says, Daddy, why did you do that? And the daddy said, because I would want someone to do that for me. And that's exactly what that scripture is saying. So you do to others as you want someone to do to you. This morning's theme is the narrow way. The narrow way. Well, Jesus' way, the way of righteousness, uh, being right with God and being right with your man, it is a difficult way. I'm not going to candy coat that. Uh, <clears throat> I've been walking my Christianity for 30 years, and it hasn't been an easy, easy walk. And not just with the body of Christ itself, but with my own flesh, my own sin and struggles. It, it's a difficult way. But it is the way that leads to life. And so I'm not going to leave it because it is the only way that leads to life. And so why would I leave the only way to life, to eternal life, because I have some difficulties? No, I'm going to hang on to it. I'm going to cling to it. And even if it's just by a little tiny string that's unraveling, I'm going to tightly hang on to that string. I watched a, a little video of a flash flood. It might have been a tsunami in another country. And this woman is sitting on her house. And as a flood is going by, it's just deteriorating her house to the point where now she's on a little pad. And the water's all around her, and pretty soon that pad is gone. She's got her dog. She's got to save her dog. And so she's got her dog, and she's just hoping. Someone throws a rope to her, and they tell her, tie it around your waist. Well, all of a sudden, the house from under her went. Dog went, gone. She grabbed the rope, didn't have time to tie it around. She clung for her life with her bare hands, which I think is amazing. And they pulled her across the water and up a two-story house and pulled her over the roof. Can you imagine? Could you do that on a rope? Just try hanging on the, on the monkey bars, right, for a little bit. But she had enough strength to hang on for her dear life. We need to hang on, no matter how difficult it is. Because the way of the world, which is definitely much easier, it's easier to sin. 
It's easier to give in to the culture. It's easier to give in to their ideologies. You know, what they say is truth and so forth. But it is the way that leads to destruction. To destruction. Oh, you might have a good time. As Moses said, sin is pleasurable for a season. And there are those who are still suffering the consequences of their sins, even though they are believers. But it's pleasurable for a season. But it's broad, and it's the way that leads to destruction. So this road to heaven or to hell, let's, let, let's read the scriptures. Now, I'm going to use the word hell, and I don't mean to offend you because I know that's not politically correct. You know, that we should use another word like separation from God. It's a little bit easier to, to contemplate, but it is the word hell. It is a place, and it has been prepared for Satan and for the fallen angels and for those who reject Jesus Christ. And, and I'm going to use it because Jesus uses it, and so I'm, I'm in good company with him. So look at verse 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Now Luke references this scripture also. But he says it a little differently. In Luke 13, 24 he says, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. He uses the word strive. 13:24 strive to do something uh, uh, with all your might, with all your strength. Uh, don't just come in and, and say, oh, okay, uh, I'm going to work at it. You know, No, strive to do it. It means that it's going to take some work. It means that you're going to have to read some books. It means that you'll have to pray. Uh, you'll have to get into your Bible. It means that you'll have to change your ways, even though you know you're right. It doesn't matter, because humility is the thing that God lifts up not pride. And so strive to enter in through the narrow gate for many, many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. So we're to strive, Luke says, into that narrow gate. The Bible teaches that there are basically two ways in life. That's it. There's not three, there's not four or five. There's only two ways in life. And there is the narrow and there is the broad. And Jesus is that narrow gate by which we go through to enter the kingdom of God. I know that there are a lot of people out there that talk about other ways and that we can't be so close-minded as Christians. We actually need to be open-minded. But let's listen to what Jesus says concerning that. Now, the concept of two ways, one leading to life and the other to destruction, appears throughout the Hebrew Bible, but also Roman literature and even the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we had recently found there in Israel. Let me read to you from the Old Testament, just so you get the idea that what Jesus is saying isn't just his new truth. It has always been truth by God. And so it was spoken of in the Old Testament too. And so in Deuteronomy 30, 19, it says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death. So there we go, two ways. There is life and there is death, blessings and there's cursings. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. And so we do have a choice, but there is two ways. And one way leads to life and the other way leads to death. And we have a choice to make. Psalms 1, 6 says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So there is a, a walk, a path, of righteousness, and there is a walk and a path of ungodliness. The path of ungodliness leads to punishment. Perish. You will perish. Jeremiah, which we just finished on Wednesday nights, we call him the weeping prophet. And as he was sharing, he said, Now you shall say to this people, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life, and the way of death. And I think Jesus is doing that this morning. He is setting before all of you this morning the way of life and the way of death. And you have a choice to make. It's, so, it's nothing new in, in the Old Testament. It, it's a truth that has been eternal. Turn to Psalms 1 just to give you one more. And it kind of gives you a, a better idea to what Jesus is speaking of here. Psalms 1. Uh, Psalms 1 is one of our theme 
scriptures for our church. I, I love the psalm. It's a psalm that we usually teach from when we're teaching the inductive Bible study class and how to rightly interpret the scriptures. But the psalmist here gives us two ways, or, or you might say two paths, two course, even two tracks. And, and he describes it in such a wonderful way. He said, blessed or happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Now, now there's the blessed man. There's the happy man. There's that one path that he takes, and that is through the word of God. He loves the word of God. He loves to read the word of God. He loves to chew on the word of God. And that word chew or meditate actually is chewing the cud in the Hebrew. It's what cows do. You ever watch a cow that's out there, especially here in this area? You should have seen plenty of cows. And they're usually, their jaws are usually, you know, like, oh, like, they're always going, always moving. You know what they're doing? They're chewing the cud. What do you mean? Cows have two stomachs. They will take the food, oranges, that stuff that smells, chew on it, right? And then they'll swallow it. Then they'll regurgitate it and chew on it some more. And then they'll swallow it. And then they regurgitate it, chew on it some more, and then they swallow it and so forth. That's what we should be doing with the word of God. We read it, think about it, meditate upon it. Maybe leave it alone, come back, reread it again. And let's think about this some more. Let's get a little deeper. That's why I love the word of God. You can't exhaust it. It is an amazing thing. And so this blessed man is one who meditates on the word of the Lord. He's, in fact, it says, verse three, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, brings forth its fruit in his seasons, whose leaves shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. Sounds good, huh? But the ungodly, verse four, are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Two ways. One way is life, and one way that leads to, to death. To death. And so verse six says there very clear, the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. <clears throat> in the Jewish writings, in their literature, they contained many contrasts or opposites. They realized that there were always opposites to things. So if there's a night, it's got to be a light or day. And, and they understood that there were things that were wide and things that were narrow, things that were easy and things that were hard, things that you could destruct and things that you could bring to life, things that were many and things that were, were pure, and for the sake of just gaining perspective, understanding that. And so it makes sense that if there's a heaven, there's a hell. If there's good, then there's bad. If there's a broad road, then there's a narrow road, and so forth. So logically, it makes sense, even in the Jewish literature. The early church was really excited about this thought and this reference. And they write in their writings, there are two ways one of life and one of death. And there is a great difference between the two ways. But let us pass on to another lesson and teaching. There are two ways of teaching and of power. The one of light and the other of darkness. And there is a great difference between the two ways. For on the one are stationed the light-giving angels of God, and on the other, the angels of Satan himself. And so this idea of two ways makes total sense, not just scripturally, which I raise above any other logic whatsoever, but in the Jewish culture and even in the early church. And it makes sense to me, and I'm sure that it makes sense to you that there are two ways of doing things. And so we have the way of destruction. Let's look at verse 13 as Jesus begins. Now, realize that the scriptures don't really have chapter breaks or verses. And so when you see chapter 11, you know, there really isn't a chapter 11 in the original scriptures, nor a verse uh, one, two, three. They add those in there so that we're, it's easier for us to reference them and find them. We're looking through our Bibles. Can you imagine if this didn't have chapter and verses? <laughs> We'd be looking all day just for John 3.16. Uh, so it's easier for us. So when Jesus starts here in this verse 13, he, he makes a statement in the very beginning, but then he changes his thought. And so just catch that. So verse 13 says, enter by the narrow gate. Stop. 
enter by the narrow gate. Now, Jesus makes a reference to this in John chapter 14, verse 6, and he clarifies and says, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Very clear, very clear. I got the opportunity to share at a funeral, and it was my father-in-law's funeral who passed away, Virginia's dad. I was raised Catholic, and everybody knew me, my mom, and our family within the Catholic churches in our community. And so when I went to the church there in Roland Heights, Father Killian sent a deacon to me to encourage me not to say something that I would regret when I got up there to share. And so I get stubborn, especially when it comes to God's word. I just said, well, tell Mr. Killian, I wouldn't call him Father Killian, so tell Mr. Killian that I'm going to share what God puts on my heart. And this was the scripture that I shared. And so I got up there and I shared about there being only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. And, and my family, uh, Virginia and the boys, uh, were all watching, and they said that the Father was so upset. He was sitting there looking through a magazine. He was just going like this. <laughs> just, just, he wouldn't want to even look at me, you know. He was just so upset. And afterwards, they... Um, they came to me to give me the proper interpretation that Jesus was not saying that he's the only way, that Jesus is saying that he is a way. And that's not what the scripture says at all. And so they're wrong. And we need to stand up for that, by the way. When we know the truth, don't let anybody, I don't care if they're a father or not of a church, you stand up for the truth and what you know it to be. Now Jesus begins here with a firm command to enter to enter, he says, enter by the narrow gate. Uh, this is at the very heart of Jesus' ministry, to see people leave their old life and come into a new relationship with God to have eternal security. It's the very heart of Jesus, is that all of us enter into the kingdom of God and that we go through the narrow gate, not the broad gate, not what you think is right, but what the scriptures say is right. And that we are to believe and trust and proclaim to a lost world. The way is narrow. And he's clear about it being narrow. And Jesus doesn't explain to us here when we enter in. Is it in the beginning of this road? Or is it the end of the road? Or is it in the middle of this road? And some of the commentaries I was reading, and they took a lot of time explaining why it was in the beginning of this road. Uh, they had this theological I guess thought of you know uh, once saved always saved type of thing or you can lose your salvation because then others said no it's at the end of your road and so as your journey is going at the end you finally know if you get in and then others said you know both of them you enter in you walk and you enter into heaven itself I don't know it doesn't say I do know this Jesus said enter it whatever it is that you make sure you're going in the narrow way and not in the broad way. But we'll talk more on that in a moment here. Uh, Jesus now teaches on this broad way. Look at the next statement. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Now the word for there is a casual conjunction. Uh, the implication is that something of an effect must be made to enter in through this narrow gate. Even though it comes after that first statement for, it's referring to the statement before. There's another gate that is broad and it leads to destruction and it's not so easy. I mean, it's too easy compared to the narrow. So he's saying for, enter, enter the narrow gate, for that other gate is broad and it leads to destruction. So that's important because it's separating the two that you don't want to go down that path. John 10, 1 says, most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. You remember reading John and how the, uh, Jesus goes on and says, my sheep hear my voice. They know me because they, they, they know his voice. And he gives that description of a sheepfold uh, where they keep the sheep at night. Uh, usually they go take the sheep out, let them feed. At the evening, they bring them in so they keep them safe from the wolves and so forth and thieves and robbers. They bring them in through the sheepfold. The sheepfold had one door that you enter in through, and it was all gated off at the end with walls. And so you really couldn't get into there except through the door. And, of course, Jesus was teaching the spiritual truth that he's the door. There's no other door. Any other way into that sheep gate is 
wrong. They're just a bunch of thieves and robbers into that door. So you must come through Jesus. Now, this is the way of destruction. And there are many who go in it or by it. Unfortunately, there are more that go to hell than there are that go to heaven. There are a lot of people that will not enter into heaven because they don't believe that Jesus is the only way. He is not their Lord. They haven't confessed him as their Lord. I think we're going to be amazed when we get to heaven at who's not there. We'll probably be more amazed at who is there too. But broad is the way. Don't be deceived. Jesus is speaking to his disciples because he loves them. And what's at jeopardy here is hell itself. This is ultimate eternal destruction. And he's very being very blunt and clear because he loves them just as much as I love you. I care about you and your eternal state. You know, I was thinking about that on, on just the other day about love. Uh, I'm one that, that struggled with love because I, I didn't know what love was in the beginning. I would tell my wife, I don't know if, if I love you. I don't know what love is. I thought it was a feeling, emotion. I thought it was something that, that you just feel for that person. Well, I don't always feel like I love my wife or love anyone. And I was just thinking about that the other day about you. And I, I said, Lord, I can tell them I love them, but there are times where I don't feel that, you know, that I love them. He goes, yeah, but love isn't feelings. Lo love is a sacrifice. Uh, do you teach them the word? I'm like, well, yeah, I I work hard at that. Do you encourage them to get involved? You know, do you, you motivate them? Yeah, I, well, that's love. So you do love them. Do you care about where they're going to go in the end of life? Well, yeah. Well, then you do love them. And so I may not feel like I love you, but I love you. If that makes sense. If that makes sense. Because I don't want to see you going to hell for eternity. It's a way of destruction. And many, many are going by it. The open-minded, that is, you know? Those people that are open-minded. I'm open to a lot of things because I'm just open. What does that mean? It makes no sense whatsoever that you're open to whatever. So some guy comes along and he tells you what he believes. Like, oh, I'm open to that. Hey, that makes sense to you. That makes sense to me, but hey, I'm open to that. No, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever to be open. They're open-minded to doctrines. Um, Shirley MacLaine, I am God. That's what she believes. I am a God. And th that's her doctrine. It's a false doctrine. Galatians is clear that heresies, false doctrines, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And there are a lot of false doctrines. Jesus is saying that he's the way. He's the narrow gate. Now, I'm not saying Calvary Chapel is the way, nor am I saying I am the way. I'm saying Jesus is. But you have the Jehovah Witnesses, and they say they're the only way. In fact, 144 of them are already going to heaven. The rest are going to be on earth. But they have the way as Jehovah Witnesses. That's not what Jesus said, though. The Mormons say they have the way. They're the only way to heaven. And there are even Christian churches. Well, I wouldn't call them Christian churches. But they call themselves Christian churches as Jesus-only uh, theology. Um, Some seven-day Adventist churches, churches of Christ, some of them, and I not, can't tell you exactly which one, so you have to be very careful, but many of them were the only church. In fact, they're so divided that you could go to their church, you're saved because you go to our church. You're going to heaven because you go to a church. And then they can go to another church that's in the same denomination, and they're saying, you're not saved, you're going to hell because they moved churches. And then they go to that church. So it's crazy. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He is saying that he is the way, simply him, in what the scriptures say. Now, we're not to be open-minded in spiritual things or what's popular in the world. I mean, there are people that just, every way, right, is okay. I mean, the guy is sincere. He's a good guy. He tries to feed people. He's not always perfect, but don't you think he's going to heaven? No. Well, why not? Because he doesn't have Jesus Christ as his Lord. He doesn't understand that Jesus is the only way. But he's a good guy. It doesn't matter. Do you think Hitler's going to heaven? This takes a judgment call. Do you think Hitler's going to heaven? Do you know what Hitler has done? 
You know, people don't even know who Hitler is. That's amazing that people, the younger generation don't even know who Hitler is. He killed six million Jews. And another five million of other people, Russians included, and these people were the ones that, that literally oversaw the killing of the Jews. And then he killed them so that they wouldn't say anything of what he did. He killed the handicapped, those were with Down syndrome, those that were elderly, put them in buses. You ever see the German buses and they have a party pictures on the windows? Hitler started that. He'd put them on there and everyone thought they were going to parties. Then he turned the, the, the uh, exhaust pipe into the bus itself and by the time they got to the party, they were dead. Think he's going to heaven? Why not? Who are you to judge him? Who are you? He did horrific things, but who are we to judge? We judge according to the word of God. He didn't know Jesus Christ. And he's in hell right now. Thank God, and I think he deserves hell for what he's done. <clears throat> Yet, here we are in America, 53 million babies aborted. That's more than what Hitler's done. In fact, I'm going to take a, a step of faith, and I don't mean to offend anyone or put anyone on a spot, so don't, don't respond. But I would say within the church here, there are probably some that have had abortions. That's how many have been done. That's murder. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. <clears throat> I can't afford to have a child, and so it would have been a burden. And that's what Hitler said. The Jews are a burden, and we can't afford to have them as a people because they're putting a burden on our great nation, plus they're inferior than us. That's what he said. Okay, okay, but... What if, and they tell me that there's a possibility that this child will be handicapped. And that's what Hitler said. These kids are handicapped. They're no good to us. It's just going to be a burden. So let's get rid of them. You can't use that as an excuse. So judge rightly. We're just as guilty. We're just as guilty. Jesus is the way. And the only way to be forgiven is through Jesus Christ alone. And he can forgive you even for that. Someone asked me earlier, and it's a, it's a reasonable question. Do you think Hitler could have been saved? Of course he could have, but he wasn't. Not, not, not by what we see happened and, and how he went. It's just no way. Possibility is there, but I'm not going to entertain it. <laughs> he deserves to go to hell. And, and I think that's scriptural. Um, see, abortion is a cultural thing. Be broad-minded. Women have rights to their own bodies. They don't have a right to another human being because that baby is a human being that God has created. I've often thought about this. How many Einsteins have we killed? How many great women have we killed because of pleasure and so forth? Oh, we are guilty of that. So if anything, and if I encourage you, if there is anyone here that has had an abortion, I know we were close. We were this close thank God, but I encourage you, fight against it now. You have an opportunity to turn it around and voice the truth to the world and let them know that it's murder and that you no longer are a part of that as God has forgiven you. No, broad is the way. It's doctrines, it's spiritual things, the things that are popular, e even their ideas of what church is and what church isn't, these are all our own ideas. But those who are narrow-minded, those who are not open-minded, these are the ones that will be led to eternity and not to destruction. They choose to believe that the many roads that lead to God is false, that there's only one road, and that is to Jesus Christ. And as I said earlier, Jesus himself said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Proverbs fourteen twelve says, there's a way that seems right to a man. See, that's left to himself and what he thinks is right. And yet the proverb says, the end is the way of death. His end, his thoughts, is a way of death. It leads to death because it's just his thoughts. I was sharing with one guy, and this is what his belief was. Really strange because <clears throat> he was sharing uh, with me about Christianity and what I believed and so forth. And I, and I kind of said, yeah, you're, you're right. That's exactly what I believe. He goes, well, I'm not so narrow-minded. I believe that 
we're all angels. And one day when we die, we become angels again. And we just live in this angelic place. And everyone's floating around being angels and helping one another. I'm like, where'd you get that? Well, there's a little book that some guy wrote. Really? So some guy wrote a little book of what we are and you believe him. God writes a book that has been proven in, in every fashion from, from archaeology, from pro- prophecy, you know, to, to, to ah, so much more. And yet you believe this one guy that we're angels. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's the broad way, and it's going to lead to destruction. Uh, Romans 8, 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, align yourself with the Scriptures and it leads to peace. So many go in the way of destruction. Now the way of life, verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, there are few who find it there. So in the context here, it's clear that Jesus is referring to a fuller, more satisfying life that comes with knowing Jesus Christ as the only way. Proverbs eleven nineteen says, uh, truly, the righteous man attains life. How are we righteous? Through Jesus Christ, the only way. Proverbs 8.35, For whoever finds me finds life and shall obtain favor from the Lord. And he that sinneth against me worketh his own soul. And all that they hate love. And all they that hate me love death. So this always starts with denying self denying our beliefs and our ideas and agreeing with God's. Saying, I don't know what I'm doing here, Lord. (laughs) And what I believed, I'm letting it go. And I want to know what you believe and what your truth is. And I am going to deny myself and incorporate that into my own life. And that's not natural for us to do. It's totally unnatural to deny those things that we've been um, indoctrinated as since we were little children. So it takes work and that's why jesus says it's hard it's hard matthew 16 24 says and jesus said to his disciples if anyone desires to come after me let him deny himself and so we need to deny ourselves to go after jesus many people do not like the concept of the narrow path to god and i know some of you are probably offended right now i'm sorry but look at look at the scripture that's in front of you. Jesus is saying this, not me. Look at what he said. Narrow is the gate. Narrow, plain and simple. And he says, and difficult is the way. That word difficult is the way there. The way may be, you you may use the word road in the King James Version. Uh, It's the same word that they use in Acts chapter 9, verse 2, when they talk about the early church. They actually said the way. Those people are of the way. Same word. And so when they saw the Jews and they were converting to Christianity and they, their lives were changing, they say, oh, those people are of the way. And so it's a way of life. It's a way of life. It's a road that we choose to walk and it's a road of righteousness. It's a road of honesty. It's a road that, that, that speaks of love and grace and mercy. It's not a a road of lying and cheating and stealing. That's the old road. That's the broad road. Don't be deceived right now because if you are a Christian and you are on a road where you lie all the time and you cheat all the time and you steal all the time, you're on the broad road. So wake up. Get on the narrow road because you won't cheat, you won't steal. But you don't understand. If I don't, I'll lose money. If I don't, I'll lose my investments. If I don't, this, if you don't, you'll lose your eternal security. Well, I don't believe in that. Well, that's fine. There's a way that seems right to a man. That way leads to death. No, because if you are saved, you know those things are wrong and you can't continue to practice those things. You're going to turn from them. There is a way. There is a gate. And that word gate there is talking about way, path, pilgrimage pilgrimage we're sojourners the bible says this isn't our home we're a part of the kingdom of god and our home is in heaven so we're on a pilgrimage here and that pilgrimage is to walk with the lord he leads us he guides us we walk with him until we are taken away to him 
<clears throat> we're to strive to enter into the narrow gate, Luke said. Let me take a moment here. I don't want to exhaust this because I could spend a couple of weeks on it, but let's just quickly talk about heaven and hell. Obviously, there's a heaven. We all believe that. But is there a hell? I think there is, and Jesus makes mention of it. So let's talk about hell first. Matthew 10, 28. And Jesus will talk about hell in chapter 8 when we get there in, in, in Matthew. But, but in chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said this, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him, that is God, who is able to destroy both soul and body, and he says, in hell. So Jesus is saying, fear God, who knows your heart, my heart. He can take you, and he can destroy your soul and body in hell for eternity. Is what he's saying. In chapter 8, he talks about that eternity and how the worm doesn't die, how the fire's not quenched, how there's gnashing and gashing of teeth because of the pain and suffering that's going on. And hell is a future punishment for those who are lost, who have not repented and turned to Jesus Christ. These are where the wicked go for eternity. John Webster said, that the greatest torture souls feel in hell is this, that they must live and cannot die. That's scary. That they cannot die. It, it's, it's eternal. It's eternal. It's an eternal place. So imagine 100 years from now, you're still in hell in pain and suffering. But how about 2,000 years from now? Or how about 10 million years from now? or trillion, quadrillion. It's eternal. Are you willing to risk? Are you willing to risk that for the broad way? To live this life the way you want, the way you think it should be lived? Are you willing? I hope not. The Bible describes hell <clears throat> as a furnace of fire, as an eternal fire, as an eternal punishment. It describes it as outer darkness, outer darkness. You can't even see the, your hand in front of your face. Hezekiah's tunnel, I couldn't remember it the first service. Uh, when we were in Israel, we went in Hezekiah's tunnel. Talk about a narrow way. And you go through this tunnel and you start the lower part there of the city of David and you're going to enter up into Jerusalem by Solomon's porch. And there are places in that tunnel that get really narrow and you just, you're walking this way to get through. And the water is like up to here sometimes. So a little scary. And then they purposely don't put the lights, I think, in some places, because if I remember, just so you get the idea of how dark it is there. And you're like, where is everybody? So they're flashing their lights, you know, to let you know they're up ahead. But you literally can't see your hand in front of your face. You know, you hear that usually it's kids. Well, I'm going to be partying, dude, with my buddies in hell. Yeah, you're not going to be able to see your buddies in hell, dude. You might be able to bump into them, but you're going to be screaming and yelling. It's not worth it. It is not worth it. It's outer darkness. It's a place, the Bible says, chapter 8, verse 12, weeping and torment. Luke, I'm sorry, Mark 3, 29, it's an eternal sin. Uh, an eternal sin because the wages of sin is death, and it's eternal. It's where the wrath of God is displayed, Romans 2, 5. Everlasting separation from the Lord, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. It's a place that you will never see the glory of God whatsoever. It's called the bottomless pit in Revelation 9, 1, and 11. It's continuous torment, Matthew 14, 10, and 11. The lake of fire, the second death, 21, Verse 8 in Matthew, a place for the devil and his demons, Matthew 25, 41. Is it real? Yes, it's real. God, this should stir us up to share with people and snatch them out of the grips of Satan. We don't talk a lot about hell. I don't think we talk enough about hell and how real it is. Do you know what the enemy wants to do to you? Have you ever seen some of the pictures of what Hitler has done to the Jews? That's what he wants to do to you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you. Not just you, but your children. You, you know, he wants to take your little children and he wants to rape them and abuse them. 
Well, how do you know that? Because that's exactly what the Muslims are doing right now to the little girls and boys out there. That's demonic. And that's from the pit of hell. We ought to be concerned completely. Now, God's provide a way. And it's through Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord, that he loved us enough to not leave us in this state, but to offer a way out of it. And that is through his son, Jesus Christ, so that we could enter into heaven where his glory is. From the very beginning, from the very beginning in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens, the heavens. And, and the Hebrew word there is talking plural because it's talking about the heavens above us, the heavens in the atmosphere, and the heaven where throne, the throne of God is. In the realm where Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit dwell, where God sent the Son to this earth to become the propitiation of, for our sins completely. So from the very beginning, God has already created a way and a place for those that are his and who have received Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, Jesus indicated that heaven was a dwelling place of God. Matthew 6, 9. Matthew, I'm sorry, uh, Revelation 11, 1 through 3. Or a place from which the presence of God was manifested. The scriptures tells how Christ came from heaven. John 1.14, uh, we, we beheld his glory. Uh, Jesus, during his earthly ministry, repeatedly claimed that he came from heaven. John 3.13, 6.33. On three occasions, we saw utterances from heaven to earth concerning Jesus Christ. The Father, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased from heaven itself. From heaven himself. So there's plenty of evidence that there is a heaven and Jesus was there and he came from it to us so that he can make a way. And we are to be on that way. There was a little girl who was talking to the Sunday school teachers about Enoch. You remember Enoch in Genesis? How Enoch lived to be 365 years and the Bible talks about how he walked with God and then God took him. And so she was trying to understand this whole concept of how, how that happened. And so she was talking to her mom and she kind of said, Mom, I think I got it. I think that one day Enoch and God took a walk together. And as they were walking and talking and talking and walking, I think that Enoch finally said, Oh, my Lord, it's getting late and I am really far from home. And the Lord said to him, Enoch, Enoch. We've been walking together for a long time. I think we're closer to my home than your home. Why don't we just come to my home? What a great picture from a child's perspective. Just walk with God. Walk his way in his path according to his word. And one day, just go home with him for eternity. Forget the other way. Yeah. Well, there's some sin is pleasurable for a season. But you can't compare 65 years, 70 years, 80 years to eternity. Please, I beg you, change, repent. The word repent means turn from your sins and turn to God and believe in Him. But you don't understand. I can't. Because if I do, my whole life is going to change. Good. Because now you have to trust God. And now you'll see God do a work in your life. He will take care. How do you know that? Because I know my God. And the scriptures are clear that he always takes care of us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. In fact, he says he's the author of our salvation. He begun a work in us and he's going to complete it until the day of redemption. And so those are promises. So you cannot afford not to. Are you crazy? Are you willing to jeopardize hell for eternity for pleasure on this earth? I hope not. I hope not. Thomas More said, Earth has no sorrows that heaven cannot heal. A lot of sorrows on earth, right? I mean, we could go all directions right now with sorrows, financial, relationships, all of these various things. Even within the church, there are sorrows within the church in relationships and in, in honoring leadership and, and then guiding those that are in the body of Christ, uh, equipping them for the work and getting along and just a lot of sorrows. The thing that keeps me going is that one day we'll all be healed. I'll be healed and I'll be 
perfect as you'd like me to be. And one day you'll be healed and you'll be just as perfect as I'd like you to be. But right now, sorrows. But that's okay. As long as we're on the road to heaven and not on that brown road. Jesus made it very clear there's two ways to life and two ways only. And so the choice that you make is very important. I pray that you will choose to walk with God.